Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 43rd edition of EHEX TV, special edition with uh, Java One 2017 coverage and there's a uh, lot to lot, lots of material so um, it's really hard to tell whether we will make it in one hour. So, um, so start with the content. So first, um, there is um, the Web Standards Igniter workshop is online. Um, it is um, already bought by it's from several countries and I got uh, good feedback which is actually surprising because in this workshop I'm not using any fancy, fancy framework I'm implementing a set of examples with uh, nothing but vanilla JavaScript and CSS and uh, the idea is uh, to implement something which looks like Java without any external libraries It's exactly what I do with Java -E. so I, I usually just use the uh, Java e application servers or Java e API without any external libraries and the same for the web web uh, stuff. So web, this is the web standards training is the URI. Um, if you like, check it out. Um, so this is the first one. Then at Java one. So at Java one, there is a talk Java e heavyweight versus uh, or lightweight. So what I did the full hour, so you can check it out here. Um, Let's click on that and stop it immediately. So this is the uh, this is the um, the talk, and uh, what I try to explain is, or what I did is, I actually measured the full hour, uh, the microserver swarms, and compared them them with a full application servers. And what I also did is, I measured the performance with full monitoring activated. And um, yeah, this is uh, what I did and why I did it because I get lots of questions in projects and air hacks, you know, what's about, about more lightweight technologies and I actually was completely confused. I didn't even, I didn't even know what heavyweight and, and lightweight actually means and this is how the workshop started. So this is uh, the news, uh, check it out, this is already uploaded. There should be another talk called uh, like um, microservice driven simplification. It was also recorded. Uh, but is not uploaded yet uh, by Java. And what's also interesting, unfortunately, was not uh, recorded. I also delivered a uh, a session called like the uh, Javaistic way to implement HTML5 apps. And what I did is actually what I also did in the Web Standards training course. I implemented a uh, full stack applications with nothing but starter standards. Unfortunately, this talk was not recorded. So okay, this is a um, Java one. Um, about um, about Java One, um, what um, I um, recorded is almost a tradition, a three minute video, and uh, with some impressions. So this is um, so the first time uh, the uh, Java One took place uh, in Moscone West. As far as I remember, it happens only once. It was in the year 2000, where Java One had 30,000 attendees, and uh, now it is uh, closer to the to the uh, Oracle Open World. And I have to say, I really like the location. Um, there was um, uh, the the rooms were very close. The 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 the, the, the walking, so you, so you didn't spend you know, the, the full break just to walk between the hotels. Um, and um, yeah, um, and the content was great. So I attended the, I don't know, 12 hours a day, I guess, just talks and um, uh, and, and, and really liked the, uh, the content. Um, and the problem was I had actually no time, you know, to drink something. So um, uh, sometimes I went out from Java One and, uh, and, and, and grab a coffee and then proceeded with the talk. So I only missed, I think, two slots. Uh, because of that, and then attended, you know, the full range of uh, of topics. Uh, surprisingly, also, so this is, for instance, the break. As you can see, there's a, a queuing going on to the food. Um, what's surprising, I met some Airhex attendees, so I met Airhex TV uh, attendees from all over the world, uh, which really surprised me, and even some from US, so from 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 Austin, Texas, and uh, one from India. So um, this really surprised me. I thought, you know, X is not that popular, but it actually is, which uh, which was a really nice surprise. Um, was also nice. Um, and uh, an attendee, X attendee, uh, asked me, "Would you like to drink something?" And uh, my answer was, "This is Java One and not Oktoberfest. Uh, we you are for hacking and not not um, and not drinking." And then I met him in the coffee, <laughs> and we had a nice talk. Okay, this is what the keynote, Java One keynote which was one of the best keynotes since Oracle uh, stewards Java. Uh, the content was nice, um, even the sponsor uh, part from Intel was, uh, was interesting. And, um, 
And what was revealed in the, uh, the keynote, several projects. Um, there was the um, FN projects, and uh, I, um, this was functions for Java serverless and EE4J, so multiple projects were revealed. And um, and the um, what's also interesting, the uh, there was a an, an management uh, change. And I think uh, the name of the guy is Mr. Uh, Mr. Karvich. And... Um, and he's now in charge of Java or or or, or, or uh, Java clouds. And um, Mr. Kavich was uh, back then at um, was uh, uh, in, in the charge of Node.js and uh, and now is in charge of Java, which is um, which is really <laughs> really good news, right? So this is uh, like the exposition area. So you saw some three D printers, and now this is the another uh, keynote. Um, this was the uh, community keynote, and there was also an Oracle Code keynote going on. So we had three keynotes, but the best one was the Java one. The Oracle Code keynote was uh, also there is the name is Code. There was actually no code there. There was there was more high level. So um, I like the Java keynote better, and the community uh, keynote was more fun. So there was the uh, walking area between two conferences, and uh, now we are done with the Java one coverage. So um, focus now on the content and back to the back to the um, to our slides, no slides to, the, to the, our topic. Um, so I get daily email, um, emails. What's about the um, the workshops in Munich Airport? So all the workshops will take place. They are already well attended. And the one, no, the most common question is, or most popular question is, whether there are seats available. And my answer is always, yeah, yes, they are. But soon they will not be because I get many concurrent requests about the number of seats. So optimistic log exception may happen one point of time. And right now we have still the largest room available. But what I always do, I try to downgrade the room because. Um, because at the same time, there are other conferences and events from Audi and BMW and uh, whoever are going on. And what I try to, to do is to offer the rooms, you know, back to the to the um, to the management of the of the conference um, venue, and um, because we have really good relations with them. So what I will do is soon I will just try to get you know smaller rooms for all the. Um, all the slots, and then there will be no seats available. So this is the whole box backstory, box story, backstory with the with the workshops here. Now, what's also interesting is um, Eclipse uh, Micro Profile One Two, and um, I get lots of questions about uh, Micro Profile and Java, and I ignore it for one year. Why? Because um, there was no added value to using micro profile over full Java e servers, and you know having a swarm or just a, a single jar uh, doesn't makes absolute no difference in my project. So what I al always suggested and always did, I never use swarm or Pyara micro in production. I I al always used the full server and and didn't consider even to use the micro profile. Now what happened? There is a micro profile one two out, and as you can see. There is some things going on, like for instance, there is a config one one configuration API, which I mean is somehow interesting. What's even more interesting is you get health check and health metrics APIs available, and they are well documented. So all the application servers will expose that. And uh, the really interesting part is the GW um, the GWT JOT <laughs> JOT propagation, this JSON Web Token propagation, and actually I get on every AHEX TV a question about that, and this will be an integral part of the micro profiles. So I think now it's time to look at the micro profile because you get a, now a true benefit of using that. So you don't have to implement it by yourself. All application servers will implement that. And having that said, what also happened is. Um, this Java EE9 is going to be, or uh, is going to be open sourced, but the open source of Java EE8 was um, announced by Oracle, and um, and everything is going to be open source. What what it means is even the TCKs, this is the test compatibility kit, which was closed source right now. So it will be a very very easy to implement your own um, application service if you like, and even the specs is, are going to be open source. The specs a little bit more tricky because there are many contributors, and there might be a problem with the with licensing or, or copyright issues. But the intention is to open source everything, and this is going to be Eclipse project, and the name is EE4J, and this is um, Eclipse uh, Eclipse Enterprise for Java, 
and this is going to be a top level project so um, having said that i really did, didn't like the name so eclipse enterprise for java um i wanted myself to know what what does it why Eclipse? I mean, uh, Eclipse is not a, uh, in, in my eyes, it's not a great brand name outside the Java community. Inside, and for Java developers, everyone knows Eclipse. But, um, you know, what's the deal with Eclipse? And it turned out this was the most pragmatic solution or selection. So there were, you know, there were uh, discussions with uh, other groups, um, but they were not as pragmatic, pragmatic as Eclipse. And be, every Eclipse project has to have Eclipse name in it. And what I remembered is actually there is an Eclipse Link project. Um, this was the old uh, top link was migrated to Eclipse. This is actually the persistent from Glassfish or Payara. And this is just, you know, Eclipse Link. And I almost forgot about that. So I was like, okay, Eclipse Link, Eclipse Link, but it's actually Eclipse project. So it, the Eclipse has to be there. So the enterprise, I mean, enterprise Java is okay. And this four is important because without the four, there will be some issues with trademarks. So only if there is a for Java, therefore we have many frameworks like log4j and sl4j, um, therefore this for is important for legal issues. So the only choice we have is to use the name. Um, and then I'm fine with that. So the uh, naming discussions are over. So this is what happens with Eclipse. Uh, of course, what would be nice or very important is, so if we st new projects we will start at Eclipse, they should start with Java X dot and not org Eclipse. Otherwise, we get you know some parts with Java X dot CDI and the other ones with uh, org Eclipse something. So it would be important to have one consistent package naming. So this is um, this this would be an important end. The micro profile dot um, what I showed you earlier, this one dot two, this uh, is also an Eclipse project and. This MVC, Model View Controller project, is also an Eclipse project. So I think it is now a lot, e lot easier to uh, put everything into one, onto one um umbrella. And, um, and what also interesting, what happens between uh, the, or the relation between EE4J and MicroProfile, and my suspicion is going to be, I guess, the MicroProfile will be more like incubator and this EE4J a more stable project. But this is a really good movement. And uh, for me, I mean, it's just great. So w what I did, before is I already um, recorded a video about JSON binding, and I was actually not um, uh, not convinced the way the conventions are set with JSON B. It means only public uh, field methods uh, methods are going to be serialized, not private. In order to have private method serialization, you will have to configure this properly. So what I did, I opened up uh, an, an pull request and suggested my solution. So it's actually. A way easier to collaborate than than before because before you had to write you know lots of emails and uh, at, at the end of the day you wrote five megs of text and there was still still no no uh, no uh, no success inside so um, great news actually so this is that and um, project FN so there is an FN project.io so actually I knew before the um, Java one that something like this will come out. I was not very, I would say, I was very neutral with that because, I mean, uh, serverless and functions are everywhere. Um, but uh, I played with that and I have to say the way how it is implemented is really interesting. Why I like that? Very simple. I recorded a video actually on YouTube about that. Um, is there still the YouTube tab open? Let's see, YouTube. Um, if you have six minutes time or even... So this is the uh, serverless Java with function developer kit. This is the FDK function developer kit. And uh, I, um, I, why I recorded the video because um, the way how it's implemented is really interesting. So you only have to implement a POJO without any external dependencies and you can deploy this POJO right away to, uh, to the serverless server, which happens to be the FN project and then call it via REST. So it is like a modern RMI remote method invocation and this is actually could be very interested, interesting even in my projects because I could, for instance, deploy a function and uh, to wrap a native code uh, and the native code would, for instance, be, I don't know, some you know uh, health insurance uh, computation or whatever. This, for instance. And in some projects, we always had you know some PDF conver um, converters and, and print jobs. And this could be actually implemented in this way. So for some specific cases, really interesting and what I like the most is the simplicity and zero external dependencies. So the, the project is called FN Projects. It's um, fully open source. And um, it is on GitHub, and uh, the great story is 
it was open sourced on stage at Java 1. Oh, forget to mention this. At the Java 1 keynote, what there was also there was an analyst from Red, Red Monk, I think um, this is Ms., uh, Mr. Governor. He already um, he already attended uh, Java once earlier or community at some times at some times. It is one of the analysts pro Java with also a great talk. What he said, uh, like uh, in the Java ecosystem, more happened in the last three weeks than the last you know, 10 years. So this is what he said. And yeah, it's somehow true. So what I really liked is the spirit, you know, the fresh ear is like a sometimes at Oracle. And I think is mainly caused by the, by management change, which I really, really appreciate. So now um, it seems like Oracle invests in developers again, which is which is crucial. So um, also uh, we had some conversations about uh, micro profile in the E4J and I was asking now, what is my opinion? Um, uh, do we still need EJBs? And my answer is, if we manage to um, implement, you know, pooling metrics and so forth in CDI, and we get one stereotype, one only annotations, we can kill EJBs immediately and then go with CDI. But I'm absolutely not interested in building my own stereotypes, you know, just to have the same behavior as EJB. So this is the whole point. So and now we have, I, I think, um, more um, more chances to do this uh, in micro profile than before. So this was also um, interesting. And uh, now start with the questions. So um, let's see. So um, someone, I get the question a lot. Uh, people who bought my book, book, all the examples were in Java E patterns. Where the examples are now, and the question is nowhere on my machine in the backup. What I will do, I will probably create a, a GitHub projects and, and, and push one by one the examples again, but because I would like to clean clean up them a little bit and not push everything. Um, so this is actually my to do. So uh, how to achieve dynamic creation of message listener in Java 7? So um, you can create message listeners in Java 7, or you can register dynamically to a queue. Uh, not problem with that. So you can just uh, pick the queue and register you as listener. And with the concurrency utilities, you can even implement this in in in, in fairly good way. Um, and uh, it, but it is not a message-driven bean. It is just a class which would implement the GMS listener interface. And um, yeah, this is this. And what you are asking probably is, or what Ms. Monsieur Metafi asks is, um, whether it is possible to create queues on the fly. And the answer is, yeah, it is, but not via GMS. So you will you will have to use you know the Whitefly specific API here, or the Artemis API here. And this is what you could do, but there is no API I'm aware of where you, you can use the API to dynamically create queues and dynamically deploy GMS message-driven. This is what you actually ask asking. But what you can do, you can dynamically register as a GMS listener. So, uh, programmer Cito, ask me. So, I guess the question is, what is the relation between HTTP timeout? and the SSO timeout. And the answer is uh, there is actually no relation between between both. So if you if you time out from a single sign on, what will happen? The server will usually you redirect you to the to the login service. This is what will happen. And uh, and JWT is not a solution. Uh, this is what I don't get. JWT is just like um, Protocol, protocol to carry data between the servers and to encode data. So you can add additional payload, encode it as a JWT and, and send the message from server to server. This is what JWT is for. And the SSO solution like Keycloak or OpenAM, they are uh, the solutions to implement uh, timeout properly. So, um, oh, VM, there's a for, I guess this is the virtual machine, VM. Uh, ask me, thanks a ton for doing AirHacks QA. Uh, so thank thank, uh, thank you for watching, actually, uh, and uh, that you are accepting this because for me as a huge time saver. I don't have, you know, to open my mail client um, that often with AirHacks. So um, what factors do you consider before choosing server-side rendering frameworks or JS frameworks like React? I mean, fairly easy answer. If you have... To provide an API um, application programmer interface for, for other clients like, like REST, then something like React or Angular is the natural choice. But um, 
JSF, for instance, is very productive. So if you don't have you know, specific requirements and you build something for yourself, there is not a big deal to use JSF. I mean, um, just go with JSF. And um, of course, uh, the question is not server-side rendering rather than whether the framework is server-centric or client-centric. So this is the, 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 the answer. And uh, there is some obvious choice, of course, as well. If the app has to be offline capable, it is really hard to implement a JSF because uh, in order to interact with the server, you need an internet connection. But what you could do, you could uh, implement a JavaScript application, which is like a Fed client, completely offline capable, and only from time to time communicate with the server. And actually building one now, right now, a JavaScript application, which is completely offline capable, and, and this application doesn't even need the server. So uh, this is, of course, it will be never possible with JSF or it could be possible, but then it will just load the JSF once and never ever again. So, uh, the patterns in my book, Java 8 patterns, written for Java 7, whether they still hold true for Java 7 and Java 8? Absolutely. This is actually the reason why I don't write another edition. What uh, I could do, write some more patterns, because with Java 7 and Java 8, uh, more patterns are possible. There are few things, and probably I could even do this, just you now update the book with new patterns. But the content already available is absolutely okay. I, of course, will have to reread the book, but uh, I just look at the implementation uh, recently, and this is still okay. Now, the question is, as well, um, you have a Java image for Docker, uses OpenJDK. Why that, and why not Oracle JDK? Well, I started with Oracle JDK. Everything was always Oracle JDK. And actually, in all my commercial projects, it is usually Oracle JDK. And my server, it was Oracle JDK, but someone asked the question, though, what about OpenJDK? Then I switched you know, the server first, my own server, to OpenJDK, and it worked well. And uh, then the Docklands, all the Docklands projects are now OpenJDK, and it also works. There are no complaints here. And a huge benefit of OpenJDK is that the OpenJDK is easier to install than the Oracle, but there's no licensing terms to accept. It just in installs. This is yum, install OpenJDK, and you are set. Um, important news from Java 1. And by the way, there is a blog post, Adam Bean blog, from me, which summarizes all the Java 1. Oh, by the way, this is fun. You should look at this. This is Sebastian Daschner, by the way, all uh, Airhex attendee. And Sebastian um, and the others, I interviewed them, performed an interview, 20 minutes interview with all people I could meet, you know, on the, on, uh, in, at the hall uh, and ask them some questions. But these are the, um, the Java news. And one thing what I forgot is, is the following that there will be no binary uh, uh, differences between OpenJDK and Oracle JDK. So what it means that in one point in time, I don't know, one year, half a year, and um, it will not matter whether uh, you will use OpenJDK or Oracle JDK. It is more like, uh, you know, the dif difference between Whitefly and JBoss, something like this. And um, and uh, you will get uh, good buy support for the op Oracle JDK and, uh, and I I guess so, and not for the OpenJDK, but they will be binary the same. And of course, this is an old news in 18.3. This is uh, 2018 March. There will be new JDK, and the name is not Java 10. It will be Java 18.3. And the feature already which uh, will come is exactly this. You will you 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 are going to be able to use all oh, this typo here, uh, stuff like this, like new array list here with the var like in the old JavaScript. So we get type inference. So and this is the project Amber. Okay. Cool. Um, where is my tab here? So let's see what happens in uh, in the chat. Ah, very good, Monsieur G, uh, G. Borand. Uh, the um, microservice and cloud-driven simplification is life. So um, I will add it to my conference list, which is really nice. What I did in this session is I try to show how much code you can delete um, uh, if you if you are if you are uh, using microservices uh, seriously. This was actually the idea here. So if you like, check it out. Thank you. Um, so what's Okay, no news here. So, now we cover that. Um, 
Web Standards Online Workshops, yeah, thank you. I'm really glad you like it, uh, again, because it's an unusual way to implement uh, HTML5 apps. Um, by the way, the reason why I uh, recorded these Web Standard Workshops is because I get many requests. The clients ask me, you know, what we should do with uh, Angular Old, to which technology we should migrate this year. And uh, I say, okay, if you just rely on Web Standards, there will be no migrations. So actually, the name, the title of the workshop should be, you know, uh, Migrations Are Over. So this would be a nice title. So. When you are using Keycloak, how do you handle additional user properties? And uh, what is properly meant is this, that um, if you have JSON Web Token, you can encode additional properties, additional payload, and you can transport this between microservices and between the client and the backend. Um, and the question is, can you do this with, uh, with Keycloak? Uh, the answer is yes, and I think this is called properties, Keycloak properties. So. Um, and um, the uh, is it is good or bad? I mean, this is a nice way to to remain stateless, right? If you if you encode everything in JSON Web Token, you don't need the session. You can pass everything back and forth, and and you are set. So this is this is the nice thing. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, what I can tell you. And um, the other question is. Uh, uses microservices actually also what we did before so the question is similar so um before key cloning the typical enterprise application so there is authentication and authorization and uh, what happened before is um, if uh, the authentication also work always work with you know uh, enterprise database like LDAP or X, um, how it's called Active Directory Microsoft Active Directory but sometimes we need additional data and um, and uh, for uh, for authorization and what we did we implemented user service and we used the user id as a primary key so we, we are more flexible and actually if you look at the older airhex tv what i uh, often do is i inject the create my own principle inject the principle and use the uh, user name of the uh, locked in user as a key and go to my own user service and fetch my properties so if you need, you know, a custom properties or a more you know, complicated setup, I would go with my own user service. So you are not depending on, on Keycloak. It's always good to minimize dependencies to, ex to, to external services. Okay, so which is the best way to handle money currency um, in big decimal? What is the, uh, what is the suggestion? And um, so let's see, there's a Java community process and if you go here for 354, this is a, a, a spec and the name is money and currency. So uh, your task is now download the spec and look what they did. And uh, I think the spec lead is from, from Credit Suisse. So uh, yes. So um, he exactly knows what, what he's talking and writing about. So download this and you will see you now what they are doing. And then if what you should do is to use, I think it's called attribute converter, and then you can have your own money class. So this is what what uh, uh, what you should do after the hex at night. So done. Um, how how do you do to do test Jaxora's resources behind Keycloak as security mechanism? I think the question is rather. Would you like to test Keycloak or JaxOS? Uh, because if you just would like to test JaxOS, you don't have to have a Keycloak installed. And um, but let's say you have you have to test everything at once. So um, even at Docklands, I think there is already a Keycloak Docker image. So what you can always do, you can have your own Keycloak in a in a test environment running on Docker with uh, fake accounts and test that. This would be probably the best possible way because you can test the whole stack. So you could create a, um, a, a Docker file with uh, Keycloak and, um, and use the, um, your service and both together and they could communicate just for, you know, test. You can have a different set of microservices for test, a different for integration and different for production. This is what usually happens. Having said that, you are probably talking about system tests and for plain system tests, Keycloak must not be required. So um, if it is, then go with your test installation. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, the last thing about the money, where is the JCP? So we need another JCP. Uh, here is it. There is, uh, there was, there is 363. 
and this is units of measurement. So uh, if you have similar problems and you know how to map, I don't know, meters. So take a look at that. Um, yeah, units of, of measurement. This both specs has nothing to do with Java, but uh, hence there is standardized look at this first. Okay, cool. Now, question here. Two years deployed to the same JBoss, each containing a jar, this is EGB jar, uh, with EGBs uh, diff with different versions. So when one resource in here uses an EGB, nothing else, where will it take it from? So uh, if you set up JBoss properly, properly means I remember several years ago, there was a unified class loader in JBoss, which is actually not Java compliant. So if you're using the old unified class loader, you will see everything. And the answer is, I don't know what it will load. But usually you have two class loaders, two ear class loaders, and then each ear is isolated, so you should only see the, EG, the jar, the EJB jar from your ear and not from the other. So, so this is answered. Yes. So, and if you use remote communication, we did it before. So we wanted to communicate between ears, but this is, I think, ten years ago. So, what you had to do is you had to set up a Corba IOR. This is I O. I O R. This is, I think, um, I don't even know what it means anymore. I O R is like unique uh, core identifier, and uh, then you could you could uh, you could inject this with add remote and with the addition to reference to the deployment descriptor, and you can talk between between ears. What I absolutely not recommend. Okay. So, question: How much of logging you advise for an application? And uh, what I uh, st start if, if I'm in a project, the logging and configuration, they are still uh, hot topics in projects because you can discuss a lot without implementing anything. It's just you no know, nice, nice small talk first. So what I do is I say, I do not log nothing. So logging is forbidden in my project. So that's my first word. And what I try to achieve is I take a look, you know, at the ad audience the reaction, reaction, and what I, uh, what usually happens is someone is really interested in logging. This is um, operations or business department or or an, 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 a stakeholder, and they tell me then, you know, hard requirements why they need logs. So if you think about this, in the year 2017, this is really strange what we are doing. So we are writing in a text file first, and then, you know, 10 seconds later we are reading from the same text file and hope we will find the information there without testing then we um, or often we we just ignore the logs completely then buy expensive tools in order to process the logs so what is uh, a lot better is would be is you know to 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 um consider a, an, an an entry in a log file as an event and send the event not to a log file just to somewhere else like for instance, you can write it directly to Elasticsearch. So structured logging is actually this what I would advise you, and not you know to write log files first. Okay, so how to convince IDXJSF is faster? I think faster means more productive. It can be used in a typical enterprise application. So I mean, con how to convincing them? I mean, the, the question is, should we convince them at all? What you should do is, is just present some facts. The only problem is with um, with uh, with JSF is if you would, for instance, rely on prime faces components, and prime ven prime faces went out of business, then you have a problem. So this should be a clear strategy what to do then. Um, but the same is true with Angular, of course. If you have using Angular material and it's no more supported, then you have similar problems. So there should be, you know, a, a plan B. What happens if you will have to maintain uh, prime faces by your own? So uh, I know lots of projects we don't do, do not use any component libraries. Then of course it will, you know, you can you can be sure that the next I would say five to ten years JSF will be still around. Um, and what happened is in Java 8, JSF 2.3 are out and they have full support for for HTTP 2, which means um, they have the unique advantage that JSF knows what to load uh, because it, it, it knows exactly which resources uh, were loaded. And then it can proactively push the resources to the browser and uh, then it's uh, really fast. So without JSF, it is only possible with custom build scripts. And I also recorded a an, an video session about that. Take a second. This is the... Uh, 
not play all. Let's see. Play all. Please don't play. So uh, this is HTTP2 push with servlets 4.0. So I present you in this video how, how HTTP2 works. And uh, JSF 2.3 are already taking advantage with that. I actually thought to record another video just about that because, uh, yeah, it is actually fun to watch. Okay, so next one. So we are here. Okay, Robert Bream asked me, and I think Robert is also one of the AHEX attendees. So he uses two JSON construct JSON object, and he is happy, which is very good. Um, one thing I don't like is following null values in JSON object builder, and he uh, uh, he used decorator background. So what you can use right now is JSON B, this is JSON binding, and they have explicit strategy how to handle null values. And uh, I didn't look at this article, but uh, with uh, JSON B, what you, uh, with JSON P, with the P, so the current implementation is, if you read the objects, you can of course specify a default value. This is what, what works. Yeah, and what you could do, of course, uh, is the, in the constructor from the... So what he's referring is... Um, there's my old blog post for me. JSON new DTO. I hope this is the right name. And what I did is I, create, I did this, JSON object. And of course, input gets string. If there is no name, you get you get um, another pointer exception. But uh, you can specify a second parameter, a default name. What probably will solve your problem is to, to, to provide here not a default name, so something like a, a provider method, which would be called on demand. This could solve the problem. Um, or you can specify null, and then in case it's not available, this, this becomes null. So um, I think the problem is what you have is you would like to have this with JSON objects and not only with, with primitive values. But decorator would work, of course. Yeah, uh, so you can have, you know, your own JSON object decorator with your uh, null value behavior. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, what is the best practice to increment auto increment increment auto increment the release version of Java Maven projects? Well, I use um, a release plugin for that in Java projects or not, is just to increment the version of the POM version. And if the POM version, uh, if you if you create the war, uh, Maven will package the POM XML to meta and classes somewhere, meta and classes, I think, and you can load this. So then it's already solved because you can ask, you know, your Java project was your version and the rest interface looks up the POM, parses the POM and, and returns the version. Uh, yeah, this is already automated in my case. Having said that, it really does not matter anymore, the version of the Java because what only matters is the, the version of the API, of the JAX-RES. So uh, we are not versioning the war, we are versioning, you know, the API. This is what, what matters. Okay, and uh, I, would, I would use semantic versioning as versioning scheme, the semver.org. So it's already standardized, so I would use that. Okay, now, uh, Monsieur Jai 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 Tis, um, asking, speaking about friendly URLs in Java projects, uh, he used OCP rewrite and now he switches to MVC. And what's about my uh, MVC Ozark uh, about uh, user friendly uh, um, URLs? It's absolutely possible. This uh, MVC is based on uh, JAXRS, and JAXRS allows you know friendly URIs. So just go with that. Um, and JSF pages, you can do this with JSF pages as well. I think it's called. Um, it was was featured in Java E6 or Java 7 You could have uh, get request with custom URI in JSF pages. This is what you could do so with MVC. is absolutely not a problem because uh, it is as powerful as Jax, as plain JAXRS. Now I wrote a blog post about why it's impossible to have optimistic to to handle optimistic log exception properly. And uh, he says, but if the optimistic lock exception is thrown at the end of transactions, this is always the case, how can I handle the exception? Um, 
so you can handle the exception always if you have JAXORS. You could of course handle the exception because JAXORS is invoked after the except, uh, exception. Yeah, after exception and after the transaction. And um, yeah, I, I mean, what I what I meant here in this in this post is uh, there is no handling strategy because um, optimistic lock exception means um, something become inconsistent. And if something is inconsistent, it is impossible for machine to resolve the error. This is what I actually meant. And can you catch the exception? Yes, you can. So uh, what you can could even do is, you could even have an uh, requires new layer. Let's say EJB has requires new and commits the transaction, and another EJB starts the transaction and is not does nothing else than uh, than uh, catching the exception and 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 reacting to reacting to it. Okay. And now what I prefer is optimistic or pessimistic locking. Of course, I mean, of course, um, pessimistic is way easier. The problem is you cannot use cluster because you are locking a resource forever. And if something locks up, everything is extreme, extremely unstable, but um, it would be actually perfect. Um, so, but it doesn't work. So in distributed uh, environments, it doesn't work. And because it doesn't work, we have to use optimistic lock exceptions. So if we, um, if we lock optimistically, um, what we need a great, you know, uh, idea. What happens in case an optimistic lock exception happens? And uh, uh, what I observe in Java E project so far, this optimistic lock exception was in in vast majority of of all cases completely ignored. So no one was interested in handling the optimistic lock exception, which is extremely bad. It's like you know, uh, no one will react to uh, to conflicts in in Git. Like like this, so um, actually this this the same problem. Um, so what you will have to do is um, you have to actually the best possible solution is to design your business process in this way that optimistic lock exceptions rarely happens. This would mean if you um, I, I mean if you if if you draw the parallel to to development is if you if you would implement a a uh, a development process. It would be important that uh, that two developers are not working on the same modules, and therefore conflicts cannot happen. So this is what would be the best. Okay, da then hi Adam. This is uh, Monsieur Matt. So, and he is writing a little pet project. So the, 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 the just write what it is. It would be interesting to know. Then I could give you a better examples. And he is asking me, you know, what I can do with qualifying producers. By the way, with producers, I gave you already an example. This was the authorization. So you can inject your own principle with your own data. This would be a producer. Qualifier, you would need in your pet project, let's say your pet project has a payment uh, interface. So with qualifiers, you can introduce many payment providers. Or uh, let's say we had the questions with loggers. So what you could do, you could have, you know, emergency logger with a qualifier emergency and an audit logger with the qualifier audit and the emergency logger would would would, would uh, write to uh P page duty and the um and the audit logger to uh, internal database for instance so and he keeps created objects in current hash map like object pool so uh, concurrent hash map and object pools are object pools are extremely suspicious so don't do this um Actually, stateless EGBs are already pooled. The question is, do you need a pool or a cache? So the difference is the object pool, the, all the objects are just re, uh, reused because of performance issues, which is no matter case. And cache means the object has data and we don't like to access the data over and over again. So therefore, you need a cache. And I guess with the concurrent hash map, you probably would like to have a cache. My advice would be, you know, forgot all caches. Measure the performance with JMeter, with Apache JMeter, for instance, first. And if it's a good enough, then, you know, forgot about caching. I hope it's clear. So how how do I handle data source configuration in a Docker environment? Uh, so I think the issue is probably, so you have different user credentials, different integration stages. And then the answer is um, all the application servers um, uh, do support so-called environment and entries replacement variables and how it works is you have a placeholders in your white flag configuration so you will set up the data source first using command line interface or jmx just watch uh, videos that show you how, how you could uh, write automatically the, the the 
the XML configuration Whitefly, and then use you know um, and open an editor and replace username, passwords, or uh, or URIs or whatever varies between stages with placeholders, and then on the startup with Docker you can have with minus e minus e um, variable you can you can specify um, environment entries and they are going to be replaced by Whitefly, Tommy, or Payera at startup. So this is what you can do. So is it possible to have requests coped with sus suspended async response? And the answer is no. What I mean, you can have request coped and inject things to a class, and request coped is at method level. So in this method, you can still access request coped, but within the async response, you cannot access the request coped. Why? Because request coped means request and response, and the suspended means this thing is, is executed in complete new thread. And this new, let's imagine, um, I'm with the suspended, I'm downloading a video, a movie, and it takes two hours. But my request coped is only now for one millisecond. It just initiates the requests and comes back. So um, therefore, you cannot have in the suspended a reference to the request coped object. Yes. And some solution? I mean, the solution would be, the question is why you need the reference to the request scoped. So this is the, 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 the main question I have. Usually, you, you should be able to get, you know, everything you need from async response. So this is, this would be, this is the, the answer. Um, yeah. And it, actually, this is an identical problem to, um, asynchronous and um, and transactions. So if you have a, um, asynchronous and EGB, a method gets invoked, asynchronous method, this method is always executed in a new transaction. So it's the same problem. Um, uh, the, the best way to implement a batch job with over a million data rows from a database. So a million is not, is not a lot. Filters them, maps them to entities or DTOs. Um, actually, I got very similar request uh, in a commercial project. Uh, by the way, no, not similar request. The, the, the client asked me to implement a batch job with Java 7 batch API. And I said, okay, maybe interesting, but what uh, what is why we need Java 7 for this? Why not plain Java SE? And what I did, I implemented a small project, which is surprisingly popular. And let's see whether I find it. Anhydrator, and this is just oh, anhydrator. So this is the project, and um, it is only based on Java, Java SE8, no Java, no external dependencies, a little bit of NAS one, and what you can do is just single dependency with some video, so you can take a look at the video, and the idea is just you have a input. Then input is converted automatically to a row, and then you can filter, transform, and then write it where, wherever you like. And uh, I think we have JDBC, um, POJOS mapping, and uh, CSV and JSON. But you can you can implement it by your own. So you can you have transform you, and yeah, this is you can build your own pipeline with Java 8. So take a look at this. Probably it is uh, good enough. And in my recent projects, um, we built a batch execution solution. Oh, uh, built, I think I spent one day or one and a half day to implement that with Java 7. And this was like configurable timer service, which executes jobs uh, in via REST interface. So um, I will look at this first. And performance and transaction, I mean, with Java 7 is really very good performance. So. Uh, so, why serialization works differently of JSON objects when it is wrapped in a POJO as compared to a JSON object serialized directly? And the answer is because if a JSON object is wrapped in a POJO, then a different specification kicks in called JAXB. This is going to be solved in Java E8 because we get JSON B, which is the replacement of JAXB for JSON. So, um, take a look at the video about JSON B. This is the solution. Uh, so far, the problem is you have right now. This JSON serialization highly depends which provider are you using. So if you're using Jettison, you get other format than Jackson. And therefore, it's a little bit dangerous to work with JAXB directly. So this is the reason. 
Okay. So JSON object is standardized and serialization from 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 POJOS, this is your object, to JSON is not standardized. Victor Röder, I think this is one of the air hackers, and I always get a sausage from him. He attends um, air hacks, uh, which is really nice. And, and, the, and the really the strangest story is there's a ver very, very famous butcher in his uh, town, and his name is like my last name is Bean, which is very rare. And um, yeah, so I always get a sausage from him, so which is very good. Why? Uh, because I'm not too lightweight, you know, so I still remain, I would say, on the ear level. Okay, now he asked me, what's the difference? That is actually a great question between uh, my qualifier doing this way and using the annotation literal. And uh, the answer is, wait a second, I will close the tabs first. So the annotation literal here, if you go to the source code, it is a little bit optimized. So equals and hash code is really well implemented. There is some caching going on inside and to string is implemented. So actually you should use the annotation literal. Uh, having said that, I so far I didn't use it in my project, I have to admit. Uh, I like, you know, his uh, solution with uh, implementing doing this. So you have to implement one more method, but uh, you don't need this dependency. But the correct, the correct answer is to use the annotation literal and um, and um, you could achieve better performance. So it was not measurable in my case. Okay, so now question about security in Java apps. Uh, and his question is about um, JPA level security first. Uh, Encrypt the data in a database level. So in one in one of my projects, the, the database encrypts the data, but this is transparent to us. So we access the data, but the database encrypts the data. So there is nothing to do for us. And he asked me you now, what's the if you would like to have a data level security, what to do? And the answer is, um, what you will have to do is you will have to use provider specific features, like I think it's called Hibernate filters. And the same implementation, the same feature is in Eclipse Link, not in JPA. And why? Because Java E7 was supposed to be cloud, uh, um, multi-tenant uh, for cloud environments. And then it was rejected, uh, but uh, the, most of the uh, uh, persistence providers still have the capability to be multi-tenant. So, um, and this is what you usually need, uh, not for multi-tenancy, rather than uh, for multi-user. So particular users only would like to see particular rows in the table. So you will have to implement this by yourself. And if your database is encrypted, I'm just wondering why you need this, because if your database is encrypted, you should not encrypt and decrypt the entities as well. So I think use encrypted database. It's a little bit slower, but it should be transparent for your needs. So. And so what you will have to do, you will have to enhance the queries so that you know, the user Duke will only use the only see the rows by user Duke. A little bit more complicated is if the user Duke only needs to see specific columns of the row, what you will need to do then is to select the full entity and then depending on the user visibility, trans transform whatever you need to the JSON object. And this is actually where also the pattern with the JSON object is great. Where was it? This was that with the uh, to json because with to json you can have a uh, principal specific object uh, pojo to json serialization cool so where this was already covered this was covered monsieur danilo danilo piazza so this is a nice name so in the Web Standards Igniter online workshop, uh, he recommends that. So thank you for this. I'm using bind in JavaScript functions passed to event handler. So what means bind in JavaScript? It means what you can do with JavaScript, what you cannot do with Java. I can pick a method in JavaScript and say, hey, this function, this method, or I do it in this workshop in a method, so inside a class. Uh, I bind it always to the instance of this object. And then that this sticks forever with the methods, regardless of what I'm doing, there is no way to know to change the meaning of the this. If you don't do this <laughs> with the bind, you can in JavaScript, you know, change what this actually means. And there was an old pattern, var, which is the old ES5, self equals this, this. So what you could do back then is you can say, before I invoke this inner method or inner function, 
I saved this in self and then um, and then uh, use that. So this is no more needed if you use bind. So I th think bind is cleaner. Seven hours ago, ago, so this is the last question. So from the this definition of microservice must be independent and autonomous. Yes, autonomous. So it is it that means it must carry the database with him? Yes, absolutely. This would be the best. Yes, how we could manage such situation? Uh, only if you understand the business logic good enough, you can handle the situation. And, and usually this is not a problem at all. So why? In several projects, we have historization tables, for instance. And what it means historization table is, you know, for instance, a client at, uh, or uh, insured person at that time had different contract than now, but you need the whole history. So if you have something like this, you could actually uh, implement. So what, what's about that? It's about copying data at various timestamps. So if you do this, what you could do, you could introduce two microservices, one historization service and another, you know, the client service. And uh, usually there's a better name for the historization. It's like, you know, um, insurance contracts and then current, I'm not that good insurances. But if you have two microservices and two databases, then you don't have the problem. So the question is whether I think the Java 8 can be used in production. Uh, absolutely not. We only have Glassfish v5. Having said that, there is Payara 5 Alpha available. And when Payara full is available, then you can use Java 8 in production. With Glassfish v5, you could, of course, use, but you have to test a lot. Or the question is, you know, the, I guess you are not going to in production tomorrow. Then what I will do, I will test with Glassfish v5, watch Payara guys closely, uh, closely, then you know ask them what they are doing, and even if you production, why not you know to set up contract with them, and then you get you know the if something goes wrong, you get great support, and then you can go to production. This is what I will do. Okay, I think I have all the topics for today, which is amazing. Uh, my my secret plan was to split the AHEX to two two um, episodes, but. Uh, we are set even with uh, Java 1 news. Let's see what happens here. No, I don't know why the chat is so client the last time, but I got a question from Monsieur Tucker. It's also an old air hacker. If you started to have a lot of exception classes, would you end up with a messaging exception package? Uh, no. Even if I have lots of exceptions, usually the exceptions will, if you have messaging, for instance, then you will have a messaging package package which not about exception hopefully rather than about you know messenger and and message service and then i will also put the exceptions so i don't think there's any case where you should create your own exception package except you are building an exception framework okay what's up here so uh no questions here i had a questions before and the question was um the question was something here how to build a distributed E4J app, databases, libraries, architectures, and queues? The question is unusual because why you would like to be distributed? So distributed per se is not an added value, it just complicates things. Actually, my big best practice is don't distribute. So I will always start with a monolith and try to stick with it. I only distribute applications if there is, there is really significant added value. And significant added value is you can explain the added value to any Java developer. You go to the developer and say, look, I have to implement, I have to distribute my app because, and if the because is clearly explainable, then go with distribution. Otherwise, you know, there are lots of almost failed microservice projects because the architects decided to have, you know, 10 microservices without knowing why. And this is uh, great for contractors <laughs> to solve the problems, but it's really bad for the clients. Okay, I hope we are set right now. So there are no questions here. No questions here. Chat, either the chat chat is offline or not. Uh, let's see what happens here. Hair hacks. Hair hacks even better. <laughs> Hacking the hair. So um, thank you. And um, one question is if you can drop me, um, what is the quality with the Ustream, live streaming? Is this good enough for you? Because I'm thinking about you now switching the providers, there will be opportunity to do something else. But if you're happy, I will stick with, um, I would stick with uh, with Ustream and streaming. Okay. So no questions here. No question in the chat. So I would say thank you for watching.
And uh, if you like Java, check out the web standards training. So this is like the Javaistic way to implement HTML5 apps. And um, if you're interested in Munich, so the next workshops, workshops are around the corner. So see you at conferences, workshops. Um, no more at Java 1, hopefully next year if my talks get accepted. And so long, check out the uh, online talks. Um, I will also announce them uh, next week. And thank you for watching. Thanks for all the questions and bye.